Over to you, you Dr. Min. Uh, I thank AIOC 2019 for this opportunity. So we've all seen a swollen disc with normal vision. So let's see what are the causes of swollen optic disc with blurred vision. So when you see an optic nerve head like this, it's a mystifying sign, especially if there is defective vision. With causes ranging from infections to inflammations to malignancy, this could be a real challenge to you. And a timely diagnosis can save the patient's vision and sometimes even life. So you have to ask the right question. First thing is to identify, is there optic nerve uh, dysfunction. If it is impaired, you're dealing with an optic neuropathy. So uh, what are the clues which tell you that there is an optic nerve involvement? A symptomatic patient who comes to you with a reduced vision, color vision impairment, presence of an RAPD, it's the most important clinical sign. You should not miss it because that could be the only clue to your diagnosis. Other ancillary tests like reduced light brightness sensitivity, reduced contrast will help you. And of course, a visual field defect documentation also is very important. How do we investigate? So this is a systematic approach. A detailed history will tell you a clue to the etiology, a proper ophthalmic evaluation with specific emphasis on the optic nerve function test, checking the vitals, especially BP and blood sugars, relevant blood investigations, including routine ones and specific ones in required cases, and finally, an imaging may be required to come to the diagnosis. So when you have a patient with a swollen disc with blurred vision, ask if it is painful. If it's painful, you're dealing with an inflammatory or an infectious etiology. If it's painless, it could be a vascular condition. But remember that a mostly gradual painless vision loss could also be a compressive etiology. So a painful swollen disc with blurred vision could be any of this, optic neuritis, neuroretinitis, posterior ideitis, or vasculitis. So how do we pin down the diagnosis? By the characteristic clinical appearance on the fundus. So they will all present with pain and sudden visual loss. There will be RAPD and visual field effects. So in papillitis and neuroretinitis, there will be a history of precipitating event, mostly like fever or flu or some debilitating disease in the past. But the fundus picture will tell you which is which. So in papillitis, you have a swollen disc with disc edema and peripapillary edema with tiny peripapillary hemorrhages. But all these are confined to the optic nerve head. Whereas in neuroretinitis, not only you have an optic nerve head edema, but you also have a retinal edema with uh, you know, macular uh, star or hard exudates arranged in a macular star or a fan appearance. But remember that this appearance may take a few days to week to happen after the onset of disc edema. So if you're seeing the patient at first, you may not see this macular star. So follow up the patient and then you will see this emerging and you have to rule out an infectious cause in this before you start the patient on steroids. In Indian scenario, I would say tuberculosis and toxoplasmosis are the two important conditions you must rule out before initiating steroid therapy. Now, all that glitters is not gold, so all disc edemas with blurred vision is not optic neuritis. So if you just do an indirect, of, sorry, a 90-day examination, you will see the swollen disc with a lot of edema, peripapillary edema. Is this optic neuritis? See the bigger picture. If you don't do a proper indirect ophthalmoscopy, you may miss this tiny yellowish subretinal detachments. So what are we seeing? So this can be confirmed by an indirect ophthalmoscopy. Also by OCT will show you this macular subretinal detachments and FFA will help you in uh, clinching the diagnosis. You will see this hyperfluorescent pinpoint leakages. So you're dealing with a case of VKH, Vogt Kwanagi Harida's disease and which has to be looked into a different perspective. So uh, you have to see the bigger picture. Again, this patient looks like optic neuritis, but what do you see here? Apart from disc edema, you can see a tiny gray white flex in the posterior pole. Also, you can see a granular appearance of the fovea. Patient came with complaints of defective vision, RAPD is there, visual field loss is there, but this is not just optic neuritis. So do ancillary investigations when required. There is disruption of the outer retinal layers in OCT, but the characteristic wreath-like hyperfluorescence on FFA. And what are we dealing with? This is a white dot syndrome, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, which is an evan transient condition, do not require treatment. But the clinch here is to make the correct diagnosis. So uh, that's why you have to see the bigger picture. Now coming to the other causes, vascular conditions can also present with a swollen optic disc and blurred vision, the commonest of which is the ischemic optic neuropathy. Yes, we often see a patient uh, about 40 years who comes to us with sudden visual loss. 
uh, with systemic risk factors. Hypertension is the most common risk factor associated with AIOA, especially the non-arthritic AIOA. So first thing is to rule out, is it ischemic uh, arthritic AIOA or a non-arthritic AIOA? So uh, check the vision and see if the patient has any risk factors for GCA. Uh, in suspected cases, also check ESR and CRP. So the typical appearance of an NAIOA is this hyperemic disc edema. Sometimes they could be sectoral pallor, but you see something known as luxury perfusion surrounding the uh, area of pallor of the optic nerve head with uh, peripapillary hemorrhages. It's a sudden vascular event. As compared to optic neuritis, which has a subacute onset, AION is a sudden vascular event. And uh, the other eye will give you the clue. There is a disc at risk, a small optic cup or an absent cup in the other eye. An inferior altitudinal defect is usually seen. So important thing is to identify the systemic risk factor causing it and control it. Very often, it is the nocturnal hypotension which actually precipitates this event. So you have to tell the uh, patients not to take their antihypertensives just before going to bed. You have to phase it out so that they are evenly phased and not taking it immediately before uh, sleep. And rule out other causes like anemia, obstructive sleep apnea, smoking, and sometimes even drugs can produce AION like uh, sildenafil, amiodarone. They are notorious in producing AION. So keep these things in mind when you're dealing with a patient of AION, especially NAION. Now, sorry. Now the more dangerous one is the ischemic optic neuropathy due to arthritic AION. Here you have a very elderly patient, about 60 years, who comes to you with profound severe vision loss. Vision may be just PL or even no PL. And patient has a pallid disc edema and uh, systemic symptoms of GCA like jaw claudication, headache may be present, but very often they're not seen. So you have to have a high index of suspicion when you're seeing such patients. And here the treatment is not uh, curative, it's prophylactic. You can't do anything for this eye, but you're going to prevent damage to the other eye. So check ESR, CRP, palpate the superficial temporal artery uh, just in front of the pinna, and if you're able to not able to get the pulsation, please think of uh, GCA uh, causing it. Initiate the systemic steroid therapy, one gram of IV methylprednisolone for three days, followed by one milligram per kg body weight of uh, oral steroids, and a very slow taper in conjunction with the rheumatologist. You can go for the con uh, definitive confirmatory test later, but you can't wait for the systemic steroid therapy here. So this is a true medical emergency. Now, the other conditions are usually innocuous, near normal optic nerve head function in a diabetic papillopathy. The characteristic optic nerve head telangiectasia tells you that it is an innocuous condition. Now, again, when you just see this fundus, it looks like disc edema with a lot of peripapillary hemorrhages, isn't it? But you have to see the bigger picture. So you have to do an indirect ophthalmoscope. And if you're seeing hemorrhages up to the periphery, this is a venous occlusion you're dealing with. This is not optic neuritis or any other cause. So other causes which can produce a swollen disc with blurred vision are infiltrative, compressive, or neoplastic processes, of which the most common is a thyroid-related orbitopathy. The diagnosis stares at you. You don't have to think much. Uh, a congested orbit with proptosis. Initially, they, see, any, any patient with thyroid orbitopathy, you have to check the pupils at every visit and also look for any color vision defects and hyperemia. Any hyperemic compressive cause immediately needs uh, active intervention. And you can see, of course, the enlarged rectus muscles with sparing of tendon on imaging. <coughs> Infiltrative neuropathies could be due to leukemia. So if you're not getting a cause, do a complete hemogram and uh, a blood workup. Congenital conditions with pigmentation of the optic nerve head could be a melanocytoma, innocuous condition, but needs follow-up. And sometimes sarcoid granulomas can also infiltrate the optic nerve head and give the appearance of a swollen optic disc. Tumors like meningiomas and gliomas initially can also present with a swollen optic disc with blurred vision. So here you have a swollen disc. Later on, there'll be pallor and optociliary shunts. And the characteristic appearance is a tram track appearance on the axial CT and a donut appearance on the coronal CT as against a fusiform enlargement of the glioma, which I'll be telling you later. So, so uh, this is glioma seen in a young age patient, it's usually girls who come to you uh, with the proptosis and sometimes exotropias, they don't realize the defective vision. Only when you look at the early stages, you may find the disc edema. Later on, there could be pallor. And you can see the optic nerve is fusiformly enlarged, uniformly enlarged, as against the meningioma appearance. 
So other causes are, in a young patient, you should also think of Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Typically, presence like optic neuritis only, young patient, painless visual loss. Yeah, here there is no pain, painless visual loss, but all other features of optic neuropathy are there. So you will treat the patient as optic neuritis, but uh, the disc telangiectasia gives you a clue. It's a pseudo disc edema, and even, you, even though you have visual field effects, there is a very high chance of other eye getting involved sequentially, and there's nothing much you can do about it, though a lot of genetic engineering studies are happening now, but you can counsel the patient. In a patient who's operated and uh, who's having a swollen disc, please think of ocular hypertony, especially if you have a overfiltering bleb or a wound leak. So this also can present with swollen disc with blurred vision. And finally, when you see a picture like this, a pale disc in one eye and swollen disc in the other eye, please think of Foster Kennedy syndrome with an intracranial space occupying lesion. But what we see more commonly is the pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome, which is due to a sequential non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. One eye already involved, patient never realized it. And when he gets the involvement of the good eye, he comes to you for a checkup. So just a short uh, case. So this was one boy who came to us with bilateral disc edema. He had blurred vision, 6 by 60 in the left eye and uh, 6 by 24. You can see the OCT picking up. Uh, and even the f he had uh, field defects also. MRI was absolutely normal. There was a history of fever a few days back. So we thought this was bilateral papillitis. And uh, the pupils were sluggish with an RAPD in the left eye. Uh, we gave him IV methylprednisolone for three days, followed by orosteroids. He uh, recovered completely. So uh, correct diagnosis and a timely management can salvage the vision. But a word of caution, all bilateral disc edemas are not the same. This was another boy. He also had blurred vision. Even though his visual acuity was 6-12, uh, bilateral disc edema, do not uh, hesitate to do a neuroimaging by saying that it is papillitis. This could be an intracranial SOL. So this child had an SOL and had to be sent to the neurosurgeon. So a case-based approach is what, what we need. Thank you.